Please discuss the background for this study. So this study came about because there was some older work that had kind of consistently shown women with these small renal masses or what was clinically T1A were more likely to have a radical nephrectomy as their treatment than other, other modes of treatment, whether it was partial nephrectomy or sort of everything lumped together um, with surveillance or cryoablation or those types of modalities. And so one of the, the questions was because the, the first AUA guidelines came out in 2009 was if we looked at the time period after that, did that still hold true? And that was something that hadn't been really looked into, um, even though there was kind of some of this older data suggesting that this difference existed. And so the, the main kind of background was just with the evolution, with dissemination of the robotics platform, with partial nephrectomy particularly becoming much more common, in addition to surveillance for small renal masses, was did this difference still exist or had it kind of been washed away with the other practice changes that had happened in the past 10 years. And what were some of the notable findings and were any of them surprising to you or your co-authors? Well, the main finding was that in fact this difference persists even if we look in the, the years that we studied up to 2013 after the guidelines had been disseminated was that women still were more likely to be treated with a radical nephrectomy for a T1A kidney cancer. And it wasn't um, necessarily surprising that we found that because there um, you know, was sort of a hint at that from prior literature. But what was surprising was that when we looked by geography, um, we saw a lot of regional variation in terms of the practices for radical versus partial nephrectomy specifically, and that also that difference uh, between the genders was more um, pronounced in some areas of the country than it was in other areas. The other interesting thing I think about the way that we looked at it is there are obviously a lot of factors that go into this decision making that we can't measure, but one of the specific things we were curious about is how does the urologist or the surgeon specifically affect that decision for how the, the renal mass is treated. And we were able to adjust for the volume that the surgeon saw, so how many kidney cancers per year, essentially on average over the study period they saw, because one of the things we wondered is that, does it have to do with the urologists that women or, and this, this could apply to, you know, to racial differences, to class differences, um, and the focus of this ended up being more on gender, but does it have to do with the urologists that they are seeing or that they have access to? Um, and, you know, prior literature has suggested that female urologists um, are less likely to do cancer surgeries, and there's also a lot of literature supporting patients prefer a gender concordant interaction with their physician. And so one of our questions was, is it that women patients are seeing women urologists who may have less experience in this space or be more likely to doing radical nephrectomy, but even when we adjusted for surgeon volume, this difference persisted. Uh, what do you think contributes to the gender disparity in the treatment of uh, CT1A RCC? So that's a, a really good question, and I think there's not an easy answer for it because there are so many factors that can affect for each individual patient what the treatment decision is. Part of um, what we could only partially assess and we don't have um, great granularity is how potentially medical renal disease is affecting these decisions. And so we were able um, to try to look at cro chronic kidney disease and adjust for that. Um, but we know that men are more likely to have advanced CKD or progression to end-stage renal disease. Um, and we also know that there's a possibility that when physicians use creatinine, instead of looking at an estimated GFR, they may be overestimating the renal function that women have. So even though we could adjust by number, we may not uh, be adjusting for the actual clinical decision that's being made as, as we may be overestimating the reserve that female patients actually have. Um, but there are a lot of other Kind of pieces that play into it that are unmeasured things, particularly on the patient end. Is it something in the interaction that male patients come in uh, with a different approach to their care or you know, second opinions or more likely to request kind of cutting edge technology or those types of things that people often surmise could be affecting gender differences that we see in clinical medicine. But in this case, 
with the decision for how to treat these small renal masses, a lot of things are in play and certainly a lot of unmeasured factors that with you know, SEER and Medicare data were not able to assess in any granular form. Um, but I think it's interesting that in other areas of medicine, we have seen the, um, the concordance with gender or with race um, affecting the provider patient dynamic. And so there also is some question of does it have to do with the fact that urology historically has been so predominantly a male dominated specialty um, that that could be some other reason with the interaction uh, again that we can't can't study but generate some hypothesis about what could be affecting this um, so what are some ways to begin addressing this uh, disparity so I think the first um, first thing is just the importance of recognizing that this difference exists and that it persists. Um, our data only went up to 2013. So in the past seven years, there may have been other changes and we don't know kind of what that this reflects necessarily today's practice. But I think the first is just awareness that there is something driving more women to be treated with radical nephrectomy rather than any of the kind of kidney sparing or nephron sparing approaches for small renal masses. And the other is, um, again, going just back to what has generally been shown with, with disparities or differences in care is that the more the providers look like the patients that are in front of them, the more those disparities seem to evaporate. And a lot of that is, is unmeasured, but there is clinical evidence that having a more diverse workforce results in better patient outcomes. And so part of that is also recognizing what we can do as part of the urology workforce to have a more diverse population of providers to treat our patients. Do you and your co-authors plan to conduct further research on this topic? And if so, uh, what will its uh, focus be? We are um, finishing up some work looking at other stages of kidney cancer, um, specifically advanced kidney cancer and seeing um, if there are similar differences or disparities in that space. We know that a lot of areas of medicine where there's less clear science or where there aren't clear guidelines for what the best standard of care is, is where there is an opportunity for biases or for disparities to arise. and so. Um, that's, you know, an interesting question with advanced kidney cancer because of all of the changes we've seen recently with new systemic agents coming out and different trials uh, results coming out with cytoreductive nephrectomy. Specifically for um, looking at small renal masses or T1A renal masses, one of the follow-up questions that this study prompted is can we get more uh, specific data about the patient-physician interactions and um, whether there is any question about gender concordance. And that obviously requires a different type of data to assess, but would be interesting to know whether that has any effect on this specific decision making. What would you say is the take home message for the practicing urologist? I think the, the big conclusion is just that nationwide in the US, we see this persistence of women more likely to be treated with radical nephrectomy for small renal masses. And we've seen those numbers over time of radical nephrectomy go down after the guidelines as robotics became more common, kind of as there was a new focus on organ sparing treatment and oncology. But this difference between how men and women are treated hasn't been affected by any of those changes. So whatever it is that's driving the dis difference still persists. Um, I think it's just important as a practicing urologist to recognize that this exists, to question in each patient encounter how you're making decisions um, and kind of reflecting on your own practice. So the other thing that we know about kind of conclusions from these large administrative data sets is that most people, when you look at that, we see a pattern on the whole but it's hard for people to recognize that that pattern may exist individually within their practice as well. And so being able to do um, some analysis of your individual practice or how you're seeing patients and seeing if it's guideline concordant care, I think is important. Is there anything else that you feel our readers should know about the study findings? 
Um, I think the other interesting thing, like I mentioned before, is just that urologist volume didn't seem to affect uh, this finding. And it, there was a wide variation in terms of the volume of treating urologists from people who very rarely saw these patients to people who had a very high volume practice in treating this. Um, and even when we did some additional work that's not within this specific manuscript, but trying to look at the different ways we could parse out volume to see where we could draw the line, even among the highest volume surgeons, there was this difference. And so even for people who are very experienced and have been doing this for much longer than I have, uh, we found that, that this kind of existed across urologists, again, with, without having much granular data other than volume of the urologist, but that, that's an important thing is that this, from people who very rarely see this to people who have an entire practice built upon this, we couldn't find any way to parse that volume out to make it um, a contributor.